Okay, guys, uh, welcome to Wednesday's lecture. Uh, it's about halfway through the week. So, um, yeah, we're almost there. And I think this is week four, I think. Yeah, I think. And uh, there's only six weeks in the course. So we're almost done week four. Um, so meaning after tomorrow, um, there's only two weeks left in the class and uh, then, then that's our summer. So uh, time is certainly flying by pretty quickly. Um, the midterm is marked. Uh, I just have to put the two pieces together because there's the crowd mark piece and the multiple choice on canvas and they're right now they're separate. So I just have to sort of um, match up all the grades from individual students and uh, pair them up properly and then get a nice round number out of, you know, and then that way, that way I can actually look at the average more, more accurately. And I, I can make like a, a nice little histogram graph for you guys and then show you and uh, yeah, that'll be done for tomorrow. And I'll, I'll make sure that that's done for tomorrow. Okay. Um, moving on. So we started induction yesterday. Um, yesterday I recapped that in this course so far, we had looked at the first, well, not the first three, but three of the four Maxwell's equations. Um, there is a sort of unspoken order to them. The first one is Gauss's law. Second one is Gauss's law for magnetism. Um, the fourth one, historically, people, physicists will call this the fourth one, is Ampere's law. So those are the three we had done. And yesterday, we, we introduced the fourth Maxwell's equation, which is actually the third one in the list, is Faraday's law. And Faraday's law described that a changing magnetic flux can actually induce uh, an E-field. And, you know, we can take advantage of that E-field. Um, you know, you can, an E-field inside of a conductor will make electrons move or make charges move. And, uh, you know, even if it's not in a conductor, you know, it, it will still induce an E-field. It just means if it's not in a the conductor, they're, they're not able to readily move. Although I suppose our definition of conductor was sort of loosey-goosey. So if you induced enough voltage, um, anything is really considered a conductor. So, you know, there is... There is that as well. So um, we left off with this worked problem. Um, the previous problem we did was a conceptual one uh, where we were trying to use Faraday's law or and or Lenz's law to figure out the direction of the induced current. So um, let's do a very concrete numerical example uh, from here. Let's see here. Let me just throw away. Nope, I got to delete. Okay. What fun. There's probably a faster way to have deleted that, but that's okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's work on this example here, just to, just to refresh our memory, I guess, of what we were talking about yesterday. So a 100 loop square coil of wire that has a known side length of L equals five centimeters and a total resistance. Okay, that's going to be important our total is going to be 100 ohms and it's positioned perpendicular okay awesome that it's perpendicular because that means we don't have to worry about any angles um, to a uniform okay awesome it's uniform we don't have to worry about a variable b field um, and its strength is 0 0.6 tesla i suppose we know the, the side length is also five centimeters um, the, the square loop is then quickly pulled from the field at a constant speed. So it's important to note that it's a constant speed because um, you can balance whatever, like easily balance using F net equals MA, you can easily balance the required force to pull with the opposing force, right? If that, that means the two are equal to each other. If there's an acceleration involved, then you know the applied force will be larger than the resistive force. So that's, that's important here at a constant speed. Constant speed means the acceleration is equal to zero. Um, and it pulls out where the B field abruptly drops to zero. So that's a fancy way of just saying no B field. Um, it takes a duration, delta T, of uh, 0.1 seconds for the coil to reach um, the, the, the free region. So it takes point, a very small amount of time, 0.1 seconds, to be completely pulled out of the magnetic field. 
Um, the rate, so then we have to, using this information, we have to calculate the rate of change of the flux through one of the many loops. Uh, we're, sorry, we also know n equals 100 loops. So what is the rate of change of flux through one of the loops? So A is asking for the rate of change of flux. So that's the derivative of flux with respect to time um, through one of the loops. Well, we know what flux is equal to. Flux is equal to BA cos theta. Now, in this class, I mean, derivatives are fairly simple. Um, derivatives are, are actually a prerequisite that we expect students to have from grade 12 calculus and vectors, MCV4UO. Um, the only derivatives we're ever going to need in, in this level of physics is, is readily taught in grade 12. So you don't even need first year, um, first year calculus, although if you had it, that would be a, an even more recent refresher for you. But here, for instance, um, we don't actually need calculus here. We can sort of approximate this derivative to actually be the change in flux over the change in time. Now, I'm not saying we'll never need the derivative in this class, but the derivative, I'm just reminding you, the derivative is a prerequisite skill that we expect that you have from grade 12 calculus and vectors. Um, but here, the reason why we're doing this is because um, we don't have a formula for the magnetic field as a function of location. We don't, you know, A doesn't change, theta doesn't change. So here, we're just going to simply compare the flux through the, the, the loop before and, and, and the flux through the loop after. So this is going to be the flux uh, in position two minus the flux in position one over the change in time. So now we go back to B A cos theta. The flux in position two is zero because position two is when it is um, pulled out of the magnetic field. And then the flux in position one is simply B times A. And maybe I can put that in brackets there to show you it's, it's a thing together. So um, the, the total amount of field lines going through the square loop when it's in the field is, is B times A, whatever the strength of the B field is times the, the um, area of that square loop. And then you divide this by delta T, and then you get simply B A divided by delta t. I guess technically you get negative b a delta t. So just to make sure we're answering the question properly, I'm just going to scroll back here. It says uh, part a, find the rate of change of the flux through one of the loops. So there you go. The rate of change of the flux through one of the loops is, is b times a divided by delta t. So that's going to be, um, let's see here, 0 0.6 uh, delta t is 0.1. So 0 0.6, I guess there's still a negative sign out front, um, divided by 0 0.1. And then A is 5 centimeters squared, right? It's a square, so um, it's just length times length. So um, this is going to be minus 6 times 0 0.025. And that's going to be whatever that happens to be, whatever that number is. Although, in fairness, um, the formula is far more important uh, in this calculation than, than the final number. So that's how you do part A. Um, the, total, the total induced EMF uh, in, in uh, sorry, the total induced EMF and the current in the entire coil. So for B, we want the total induced EMF. Okay, so that means Faraday's law. So the induced EMF is going to equal to negative N times the change in flux with respect to time. So this is Faraday's law. And the total flux would be 100 loops times our answer from part A. So our answer from part A is B A over delta T. So our answer, our, our answer really should be a hundred times that of part A. hundred times bigger, that is, than part A. Um, just to make sure um, we are sort of on the right track, uh, we see here 
that the answer for, oh, let me draw a different color. The answer for part A is uh, minus 1.5 centi Weber, centi, like centimeter times 10 to the minus two. Um, this formula says here that we should have something 100 times larger than what we got in part A. So if, you know, our answer for part B, as you can see, is 1.5 volts. Well, what, like 1.5 centi Weber, get rid of the centi, you get 1.5. So this seems to uh, be, be fitting with what, with what the answers say. Uh, the other thing they want to know in part B is the total current in the entire coil. So uh, for the total current, we use Ohm's law. So for total current, we use Ohm's law. So Ohm's law is V equals IR, if you remember from your studying for your midterm in the previous chapters. Now, our voltage is not coming from a battery. And I, I already said that in this class, I'm going to try very hard to remember to use um, that script E when we're dealing with an induced voltage instead of like a, a wall or a battery voltage. So in this case, this is going to be the induced voltage times IR, which means the current is going to be the induced EMF divided by the resistance. But we already know what the induced EMF is in the entire coil. It's going to be 100 times BA over R delta T. So the, the R is, is around there from the current calculation, and, and the delta T is there from the EMF calculation. And again, you can just you know, plug, in, plug in your values. Now, I think we, we looked up the answer for, for part B. I think the answer for part B was 1.5 volts. And the resistance was 100, 100, oh boy, that's a terrible 100, uh, is 100 ohms. So this is going to be 1.5 centiamps, or you know, times 10 to the minus 2, like centimeter times 10 to the minus 2. So that's B. And um, C, uh, I to, I'm running out of room here. There we go. Uh, and then C is asking for how much energy is dissipated in the coil. Well, energy, um, well, in this case, what type of energy are we talking about? Are we talking about kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, um, electrical potential energy, the capacitor, the energy in a capacitor? Um, what kind of energy are we talking about here? So in the context of, of current, the energy that's dissipated in an electrical circuit is usually, well, due to heat in some, in some fashion. I mean, uh, if you're using your, your circuit to power a TV, then yes, I mean, part of that energy goes into um, creating light and sound and stuff like that. But um, generally, any piece of uh, electrical equipment that requires power, you, in a circuit diagram, you can represent that as a resistor. And we usually say, you know, when, how much energy does it consume? We're talking about, you know, it's total. I mean, whether the TV is, is using some of the energy for its sound output, some of it's for the, 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 the LCD screen. Um, the LCD screen itself will throw some heat. We just kind of lump all that in together and call that just it, its total energy of being wasted electrically. And we just calculate, we just say that that's, that's electrical heat or electrical energy that's wasted. Now, it's not a Coulombic energy. So that's what I'm trying to say here is how much energy is wasted. I'm going to say note that it is not Coulombic energy, right? Coulombic energy is, is the potential energy um, two charged particles have relative to each other. Right? Coulombic means, the word Coulombic in physics means two individually charged particles. Um, this is not that. So this is talking about um, circuit energy and how much energy passes through. So this is where we actually have to borrow um, our, our knowledge of, of power and how it relates to energy. So we say, oops. So we say power is going to be energy consumed over time. So we, we reviewed that in a previous chapter. And uh, we're asked for energy, so we can obviously solve for energy. So it's going to be power times delta T. And then we ask ourselves, okay, well, what do we have? What do we need? We have delta T, right? Delta T is 0 0.1 seconds, so that's, that's cool. However, we don't know power. 
right? So what, uh, what formulas do we have for power? Well, you might remember that we have P equals IV as our, as our base formula for power. And uh, we have voltage, total voltage from part B, and we also have total current from part B as well. Now, you could use P equals IV, absolutely. And we have the formula for B, we have, or, um, sorry, not B, we have the formula for V, we have the formula for I. You could just use those and multiply them together and, and Bob's your uncle. However, um, I'm just gonna warn you that there are no hero marks in physics. Actually, there are no hero marks in life. So um, a, a wise, a, a more wise approach would be to approach this, actually any question in any course, this course or, or any course, um, to, to minimize the chance that you carry forward a mistake. So um, yes, you may have made a mistake in calculating the total, the total voltage. And if you did, I, I, you know, there's nothing to help you there. But let's say there is a, there's a, a slightly less risk that you got um, the first part correct and then you, you messed up in the second part, right? So perhaps, what we have is we have voltage. Let's not use two calculated values. Let's see if we can only use one calculated value. So let's try to get everything in terms of voltage. So we can swap out current in with, with Ohm's law and, uh, and, and then get everything in terms of volts. And we're, we're given resistance as a constant, so that doesn't really introduce any, any risk of us, of us screwing it up. So V equals IR. So we can replace I with um, V over R. So you're gonna get V squared over R. Now again, I can't stress this enough. Um, they're both equivalent. It's just, they're only equivalent if you assume you've done the current calculation correctly and you may not have, right? There's calculator mistakes, there's plus minus mistakes, there's substitution mistakes. I'm trying to mitigate the chance of you propagating forward uh, an error that you may have made so um, it's just a technique I've learned in my many years of doing, well, science. And it's always just good practice to do. So let's move forward with that. Uh, so P is going to be V squared over R times delta T. And um, we are given delta T, we're given R, so that's no problem. Uh, v is actually the electromotive force. And we calculated that previously. So that's going to be, um, let's see here, NBA over delta T squared times delta T all over R. Okay, so that's me plugging everything in. And then after I do some simplifying, um, some, some simplifying, the delta, one of the delta t's will cancel, and I'm gonna get n squared, b squared, oop, not delta, um, a squared over, let's see here, r delta t. There you go, and that equals the electrical energy that was dissipated uh, in, in the circuit or the coil um, during the time that you pulled it out. So um, if, if, um, if you were to place, you know, um, some sort of resistor there, whether that be a light bulb, whether that be a TV or a speaker or literally anything electrical, um, as you're pulling the coil out of the electric field, you could use this much uh, electrical energy joules, this, this many joules, to help power that electrical device. So this is a way in which you can convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. Mechanical energy means with your muscles, you're, you're literally using your muscles to move a coil back and forth or, or to move a coil in one direction. And um, that amount of work done through Faraday's law can be transformed into electrical energy and then that can be used to power any device you need. And this is really, this is the core of um, the premise of generators. You know how like uh, 
you know, you, you've got a generator in your car, it's actually called an alternator. Um, you know, some cottages might have like a, a, a gas generator outside. Um, you know, hospitals have, have generators on the roof in case the power goes out. You know, a generator is a way to, to, to use mechanical energy. You know, you can burn some gasoline to, to mimic your arm going back and forth. You can burn some gasoline to turn an engine. And then you can use that sort of rotational motion to like move a coil continuously in and out, in and out, in and out. And then you constantly get these, these joules of energy to put toward powering electrical devices. So that's where eventually we will be going with this chapter. We will be talking about generators, but in due time. Okay, next up. So we can talk about an induced voltage in a moving conductor. Um, up until now, we have been um, looking at a loop of like a closed circuit, like a conducting circle or a conducting square, um, and, and how you can manipulate the flux. And there's three ways to manipulate flux, right? There's B, you can change the B field, you can change the area of the loop, uh, or you can change the angle of the B field, right? All of which will change the flux across a certain area. Um, however, it just so happens that uh, you don't necessarily need uh, um, um, a loop or an enclosed area of wire uh, or conductor to generate a B field. All you need is a moving conductor. So even a rod that's moving, uh, you can induce a voltage in that rod. So consider this for a second. Consider uh, this is called a rail gun, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll have a video for the rail gun uh, later on in the slides. But consider this. You have a conducting wire that you bolt to the table. You know, maybe you glue it or you tack it down with some nails or something like that. I don't know. It, it's, it's part of the ground. It's a conducting wire that's part of the ground. And what you do is you have a metal rod that you just loosely place on top. You don't, you don't like glue it down or nail it down. It's just placed on top of the metal, the metal uh, rails. And then what you do is you grab the rail with your hand and you physically, with your muscles, you physically pull it this way with, with some sort of force. Now, if you pull it this way, obviously, it will have some sort of speed V inherently. Now, why is this being talked about? Why is this even a, a thing I'm bringing up on the lecture slide? Well, the point of the conducting, the red conducting rails that I've drawn, is that there is a loop that is formed between this loose metal rod and the, the U-shaped rails that are attached to the ground, right? Everything is a, is a conductor. So as long as they're touching, then they're, they're forming an electrical loop. Now, here is another way that you can, you can manipulate Faraday's law to your advantage. What's happening here is, when you first put the metal rail down, the metal rod down, it forms some sort of enclosed area. Uh, let me maybe write that in a different color. It, it forms some sort of enclosed area. And when you pull the rod, in this example, you're pulling the rod to the right. When you pull the rod, what you're doing is you're increasing the area. So that's a change in flux. You're changing the number of field lines that are going through the area. I'm going to erase my doodles for a second so you can see better. So originally, we have one, two, three, four, five, six field lines going through that area. But as I pull it forward, maybe half a second later, uh, I've now encompassed two more field lines than I, than I used to uh, just a moment ago. So that's a change in the flux. So that's a change in the number of field lines. But what variable am I manipulating? Am I, am I manipulating the angle? No. The B field is still into the page, the, the, or no, out of the page. The area is still out of the page, so the angle is constant. Um, the strength of the B field, am I manipulating the strength of the B field? No. Uh, what I am manipulating is the area the total area. So if you look at Faraday's law right there, it says the induced voltage, EMF, is going to be equal to the changing flux. Well, flux is the derivative of B times A with respect to time. Now we think to ourselves, 
when you have a derivative, you are able to factor constants out of the derivative. So we say, okay, which one is changing? Maybe they're both changing. If they're both changing, then, oh boy, then, then we have to do product rule. That's really annoying. Um, however, if they're, they're not both changing, luckily the B field is constant. So we can actually factor out the B field and we can say this is just going to be B times the derivative of area. All right, well, what kind of area do we have? Is it a circle that's just getting bigger? Is it a circle that's getting smaller? Is it a circle that's keeping the same perimeter but just being deformed? What's happening? Well, what's happening here is we have a rectangle that is maintaining the same width, but is getting longer, or I guess maintaining the same height, I should say, um, but getting longer with time. So um, I guess they've, they've labeled the, the, the height L for length, I suppose. So I'll, I'll use their notation. So I, I make note here that the area is ac actually equal to length times width. And then again, when a rectangle changes, there's no guarantee that only one dimension is changing at a time. If you have the length and the width both changing simultaneously, then you'd have to use product rule. However, in a rail gun, the rails are constant. All you're doing is you're making the width longer. So we again can factor out the L. And we get that the induced voltage is B times uh, length times the derivative of the width, the rate at which the width is increasing. Now, this is a function of how fast you're pulling. The faster you pull, the faster the width is increasing. The, the slower you pull, obviously, the, the slower the width is increasing. So we can represent this, in fact, by um, a function of, of, of time. So we can say that um, this is going to be B L and um, width, or, or the derivative of width, I should say, it can be represented by um, speed times dt. And then we have that sort of dt there. And just to be clear as, as what substitution I did, I said the derivative of width is going to be speed times the derivative of time. And if you don't know where that came from, that's velocity equals distance over time or more specifically, the change in distance over the change in time. So here in this equation, the delta t's cancel, or the dt's cancel, and then you end up getting BLV equals the induced EMF. Now, interestingly, that was a fairly easy derivation, might I say. Um, however, the interesting part of the result is that area of the loop is not within itself uh, in the answer, right? We used area to, to, to make the derivation, but the answer itself does not depend on the area, which makes sense, right? Because the induced EMF is not a function of the flux. It's a function of the change in flux. And the change in flux in this instance is not a function of how big the area already is. It's a matter of how fast the area is increasing. So, an interesting implication of this formula is because there's no area, I'll say note that there is no area in the answer, it led physicists to sort of think, well, hold on, maybe we don't even need a, a closed loop. Maybe we don't even need an area because the answer isn't the fun, the induced voltage isn't a function of area. It's just a function of the length of the rod and the speed of the rod. So interestingly, they went to go test that. And they just took a simple metal rod and they moved it through a magnetic field by pulling it. And they were with, without a complete circuit, it was just a rod, and they were able to confirm that there was a potential difference between the ends of the rod. Now, the difference being there's no current. So I will say, um, uh, in, uh, we can get an induced voltage in a moving rod. However, since there is 
no complete circuit, there is no current. Now, just because there's no current doesn't mean there's no voltage. Okay, so this comes back to the like insulator and conductor argument. Um, you know, you can think of air as, as a conductor at a very, very high voltage. But if you're not at that breakdown voltage, you're not going to complete the circuit. So really, all that's happening here is you are creating a separation of charge. So in blue here, I'm going to say you are creating a separation of charge which can be thought of as sort of a dipole, if you'd like. Um, another way you can think of it is it's sort of analogous, sort of like a capacitor. Right? A capacitor has uh, positive charges on one plate and then nothing, and then negative charges on the other plate. And that's effectively what is happening here. Now, if you're trying to wrap your head around, well, Mark, there's no complete circuit, there's no area. How do you even calculate flux when there's no area? Um, how does this work? Um, another way to explain this phenomenon, although you, it, it's, you can't get the formula this way, but another way to conceptually represent this phenomenon is we know the magnetic force on a moving charged particle. Not on a circuit, not on a current, just an individual charged particle. We talked about this way back in magnetostatics. I think it was the beginning of last week. You know, for instance, take an electron, a loose, a loose uh, electron in this conductor. And if it's an electron, so you use your left hand, not your right hand, your left hand. And you can use a few right hand rules if you want. You can use the physics gangster sign just with your left hand instead of your right hand. So um, your thumb is the thrust, your index finger is the current because it starts with I. Uh, or the velocity, and then your middle finger is the magnetic field. So if you prefer to use the physics gangster sign, you can go nuts. Um, if you prefer to, you know, the, use the give me money right hand rule, I guess in the sense it's left hand, you can use that one too. I'm going to use the give me money one. So um, fingernails in the direction of the B field. So left hand fingernails are out of the page because that's what we see here is, is little dots. Um, my thumb has to point in the direction of the velocity, so I have to flip my hand upside down. My thumb is pointing to the right, my fingernails are pointing at me, and the palm of my hand is facing upwards. So you see here that using magnetostatic principles, not even Faraday's law, but magnetostatic principles, you can actually predict that the negative charges or the electrons in this rod will actually feel an electric force upwards. And they will move, they will literally separate. So um, I shouldn't say there isn't any current. I should say that there is a, a small amount of current for a very short period of time while the charges are in the middle of separating. However, once they're separated and all the negatives, no, negatives are blue, while all the negatives, once all the negatives hit one end, they have nowhere to go. So they pile up there and then they just stay there stationary. So when I say there's no current, I mean, after things have been separated, there's no current. If you had a complete circuit, they would just keep flowing around in a circle because that's what a circuit is. But when there isn't a complete circuit, they don't. They just go to one end and stay there, just like a parallel plate capacitor, or like when you induce a dipole. And obviously, the other end is red because it's positive, and all the textbooks use red. And if you want to know where the positives go, even though we know now in modern science the positives don't actually move, um, you could use your right hand rule, um, you know, fingernails out of the board, uh, your right hand of thumb is pointing to the right, your palm is pointing down. So that's another way to, to analyze this. So this means that a moving rod will actually have a potential difference between the two ends of the rod. A little side story, um, can you think in real life, can you think of a real life example of, uh, of a metal rod or, or what could be approximated, I suppose, as a, as a metal rod that is moving through a magnetic field on a regular basis. Actually, I'm gonna open the chat now because I wanna see. Oh, I, I hit something, what did I hit? Um, I, okay, let me, I don't know what I clicked. I'm gonna go back to the chat. 
And now the chat isn't opening. Of course it's not. Okay, hold on. Welcome to Microsoft products. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the question. It, can you think of a real life example of when uh, a metal rod uh, is traveling through uh, a magnetic field? Is that, is that, can you think of a real life example of when this would happen on a fairly regular basis? And I know we've all, we all know what this is. What I'm trying to get at, I, we all know what this is. Uh, to answer your question, Rodrigo, yes, you can deduce the sign um, of, of the side based on the B field. Well, well and, and the direction of motion, right? Because it's a cross product. Q, V cross B. If you remember the right-hand rule, the, the formula for that is F equals Q, V cross B. So you need to know both the direction of the B field and the direction of motion. Okay, does um, anyone have any ideas of, of in real life when you would, when, when you would get a, an actual uh, metal rod or, or something that can be approximated as a metal rod moving through uh, a, a magnetic field? Any ideas? Hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing anything coming through. So I know everyone, and especially in today's climate, um, there's a lot of talk about, about this specific thing here. Um, an electric guitar bridge. That's an interesting thought. Um, although, although electric guitar bridges do use, um, they do use the principle of Faraday's law, it's a little bit different. And we will talk about electric, well, the premise of electric guitars later on. It's actually a transformer. It's, it's not solely just this. What I'm getting at here is actually airplanes. Um, and now with COVID, the topic of air travel is, is, a big, is a big thing right now. Do you really want to get on, in, you know, in a, in a petri dish of an airplane um, and travel with, with recycled air uh, for any length of time during COVID? But anyway, point being, uh, an airplane, the wings, even the fuselage, but the wings, are you know a, a metal conductor from tip to tip and the earth has its own magnetic field right we know the north pole is well geographic north is north which is weirdly um well not so weirdly what you know but magnetic south so the, the, the earth has its own magnetic field and when airplanes are traveling they're traveling through a constant magnetic field so the you can actually approximate this come on you can actually approximate this as an airplane flying. And there's actually circuitry uh, in the plane that has to accommodate for the, the voltage difference between the wingtips because, you know, that could cause, you know, interference with other instruments. Um, there's a, it, it's a buildup of charge and, you know, when you have motorized mechanical things in a device, they are definitely sensitive to the flow of charge because the flow of charge is a current. So, um, you know, there, there has to be, uh, accommodations for that. The, the, the engineers of an airplane have to sort of take this into consideration and it, it's not big. It's not going to cause like any sparks or lightning or anything, but it's enough that, it could maybe cause some safety issues. When you're flying the plane and you want, you want a certain aspect of the plane to do something, you need to depend that it reacts to what, what you're telling it to do. And you, you can't afford to have any sort of um, mechanical malfunctions uh, of any sort, uh, let alone due to some physics phenomenon that is well established, right? So that, that's just unacceptable. So anyway, I just thought that's a cool example of, uh, of, of that. Okay, so. Uh, moving on, we, we let's go back to the railgun for a second. Uh, if we look back at the railgun, if we if we kind of put this this uh, rod um, rod back onto a U-shaped rail, we can use uh, Lenz's law to figure out the direction of the induced current. So um, if if we are pulling the rod to the right, we are increasing the number of field lines through the surface. Okay, so Lenz's law says a current will be induced to oppose that. So we are increasing the number of field lines out of the page. So we want to decrease the number of field lines out of the page. So the, the in, Lenz's law says the induced magnetic field won't be out of the page, it will be into the page. So use your right hand, put your thumb into the screen, 
and then wrap your fingernails and the, the direction of your fingernails will show you the direction of the induced current as a result of Faraday's law or Lenz's law. So here you see the induced current will be clockwise. And uh, there are many ways to think about this. Again, if you want to think about the, um, the individual charges, because all current is is just a series of, of charges that are lined up in, in a neat row like you were in kindergarten. So, you know, if you want, you can think of, you can think of a positive charge in, um, in, this, in this rod here, a single lonely positive charge in this wire. And you can use F equals, if you wanted to, you could use F equals Q, V cross B. And you can use your physics gangster sign. You can use the give me money. And you can see that the positive charges would be forced downward. And that also tells you that if, if that was hooked up to uh, the rest of a circuit, then it would be flowing clockwise. Okay, um, so I think, I think that's mostly what we, oh, sorry, here, um, there's an aspect that we haven't talked about yet. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Obviously, that's, that's just a saying that is just universally true, whether it be in school or physics or life. There's no such thing as a free lunch. What does that mean in terms of physics? Well, it means you can't get something for nothing. Before we were pulling on it, there was no current. Now that we're pulling on it, there's a current. Well, there has to be something, Newton's third law, there's a force causing the current, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction force. Right now, we can, we can sit here for, for years, you know, we, you could be in fourth year physics and we can still talk about the details of of the mechanism by the for of the force in the wire that pushes the electrons, yada, yada, yada. You can just understand though that there's a current, there's something pushing them. It's the E field, blah, 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 blah. But Newton's third law, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Let's look at that now. We know the induced current is downwards, right? We said that on the previous slide. Well, look at this equation, F equals ILB. Okay, it's a very similar equation to F equals QVB. In fact, it is the same equation. You're just moving the T, the, the division by T to Q instead of the D. So F equals ILB. If you have current, you can use your physics gangster sign. If you have your current, index finger current pointing down, middle finger MF magnetic field is pointing out of the board, then your thumb for thrust is going to be pointing to the right, sorry, to the left, to the Beyonce, to the left. So as you're pulling, your arms, your muscles are physically pulling this to the right. If you were doing this, what your muscles would feel is a resistive force. And your brain, now your eyes can see it, but your brain can't see it. Your brain just feels there's a resistive force. It doesn't know where it's coming from. And if your eyes didn't know physics, your eyes would be like, oh my God, this is, this is an invisible resistive force. It's magic. However, the physics says the resistive force is uh, an opposing magnetic force. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So this resistive force, is actually so famous because it's unavoidable. In fact, pretty much all of physics can be pretty much summed up by there's no such thing as a free lunch, i.e. conservation of energy. Um, this is so unavoidable and such, such a, an important concept in, in circuits and electromagnetism that we've called it a name. Uh, it's called eddy currents, named after the person who sort of formalized the notion. Um, more technically, there, it's called a back EMF. A, a, a back EMF resists the flow of, of, the, of the current. And um, that's, that's what's happening here. A back EMF is something pulling backwards. If, if you're pulling it to the right, a back EMF literally will pull it backwards. It'll try to tug of war and it'll try to put it back to the left. So it's called a back EMF technically, but most physicists will, will refer to them as something called an eddy current. And an eddy current is just a current that is induced that, that resists the, the change. It, it will pull backwards. So I want to show you 
um, a video of a rail gun because I don't think my explanation has done it justice. Usually when I teach this class in person, I will bring in a rail gun and I will show you a rail gun in person. However, we don't have that luxury this year. So here's a video, I hope you like it, of, of a rail gun. Okay, so you saw there they had two pieces of electrical tape, uh, which is usually used by um, like furnace people, HVAC people, because they, they use it to wrap ducting. Um, but physicists love electrical tape. Uh, and this isn't, it's, well, it's not really electrical tape. It's, it's not that black rubbery tape. Um, it's conducting tape. And we use it all the time for fun things like this. So um, what they're doing here is they're, they're using that conductive tape um, on, a, on just like a wooden board and that acts as the sort of metal rails and they have two circular magnets that are connected by probably an aluminum rod or not aluminum probably some sort of steel rod or something and um, those those circular magnets are what's generating the the magnetic field in that region because that's that's a very crucial part of a, of a rail gun and uh, because of that magnetic field, you saw them hooking up a battery and you saw them um, clamping the two ends of the battery to the ends of the, of the conductor tape. And they sent a current through it. And, and that's the physics of a rail gun. So you saw it, 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 um, it they, they gave it a little bit of a nudge. And uh, once it was moving, there you go. It was, it was, uh, it was a rail gun, pretty cool. Um, I, I looked briefly at the chat um, while, while the video was happening. So to answer the most recent question, um, the eddy current is the current induced by Faraday's law. And when we say like a back EMF, that's just another word for, for it. I mean, an EMF is a voltage and a current is a current. So, you know, when you talk about eddy currents, we're literally talking about the current that is induced as a result of Faraday's law. Um, and then you talk about a back EMF is just divide by resist or um, multiply by resistance you get EMF, you know, V equals IR. So one's, one's the current we're talking about, one's, one's the voltage we're talking about, but they're, they're almost interchangeable. Um, as long as you understand that the result is, is the, the induced, induced um, uh, either current or, or voltage. Okay. So um, here is a conceptual question about rail guns. So I want to see kind of how, how with me everyone is. So I'm going to launch a poll. Actually, no, before I launch the poll, because I don't want to intrude on your screen yet. Here, let me shrink this a little bit so you can see it. Okay, so let me launch the poll. Here we go. So let's see how many of you are following along with me. A conducting rod slides on a conducting track at a constant B field that is known to be directed into the page. What is the direction of the induced current? Clockwise, counterclockwise, or no induced current? Oh yeah, the Jeopardy music. I keep forgetting about the Jeopardy music. I think I saw an interview with Alex Trebek recently. Um, I think he wrote a book during, during this COVID quarantine. 
interesting guy. I think he spent like almost 30 years or something like that as the, as the host of Jeopardy. It's a long time. 62% of you voted. 65%. Oh, 81. Okay, that jumps pretty quick. Interesting. The, the results are very interesting. Okay. 84% of you. Okay, I'm going to hide the poll or stop the poll and then I'm going to share the results. 37% of you voted A, 48% of you voted B, and 15% of you voted C. So it looks like there's a pretty neck and neck race between A and B. So instead of scrolling down and explaining it, um, I'll, I'll say a few things, but I won't explain it fully. And then I'm going to relaunch the poll because I kind of want to see how things are different. Um, so we have magnetic field into the page. Uh, we have a, a permanent fixed rail that is not moving. And then we have a rod, a blue rod laying on top that is known to be moving to the right. We have that sort of enclosed area. And as it's moving to the right, the, that enclosed area is getting larger and thus including a, a, a different amount of magnetic field line. So it, its flux is changing. And we are using uh, uh, Faraday's law and Lenz's law to predict the direction of the induced current. And the induced current, Lenz's law says, is going to be opposing the direction of the change in flux. So think about that again. I'm going to relaunch the poll. And uh, give it another thought. And I want to see kind of how, how that has changed your, your perspective on what's going on here. Forty six percent of you, fifty three percent of you, fifty nine percent of you, sixty eight percent of you, seventy one. We're getting there. I think we hit like eighty one or eighty five or something like that last time. Percent that is seventy eight percent. Oh, yeah, the results are much different now. 78, well, we got to 80 something last time, but for the interest of time, I'm gonna end the poll. If you didn't get a chance to vote, that's okay. You know, again, I'm not marking these. I've got, they're anonymous. I've got no idea who's, who's voting here. So if you didn't get a chance, that's totally okay. I'm gonna end the poll and now I'm gonna share the results again. So it's an overwhelming majority now is B. Um, nobody voted C this time. So uh, let's have a look see. Now I'll explain it. Uh, let me stop sharing so you can get your screen back. So let's have a look-see here. What's going on? Well, as the blue rod is moving to the right, we are including more field lines into the page. So the change here is more field lines into the page. We want to oppose that. So to oppose more field lines in, the induced B field has to be more field lines out out of the page. So the induced B field is out of the page. Use your right hand, thumb in the direction of out. So, you know, hold it away from the tablet screen, presumably pointing at you. And then you wrap your fingernails in the direction of where the induced current would be. So if my thumb is pointing out of the board, my fingernails on my right hand would look counterclockwise. So the answer is counterclockwise. So there you go, that's the answer counterclockwise. Okay, I wanna delve a little bit deeper into what an eddy current is. Um, full disclosure, this slide will not be testable because we are not gonna be studying the math of this type of current. Previously, when we had a circuit and there was, only, there was a, a very well-defined path for the current, no problem. We can use Ohm's law, Fair, well, Faraday's law first to obtain voltage in, in conjunction with Ohm's law to, to analyze the circuit. This slide just shows you how interesting physics can get. This slide says you don't even need a wire, like a circuit or, or, or something predefined like a road. Okay? This says you could have a slab of metal 
a slab of metal, meaning it's not a wire. The electrons are free to move anywhere they desire in the, in the two-dimensional plane. They can go forward, back, up, down, in any combination thereof. Okay, it's a slab of metal. And what's happening here is you still get eddy currents. Now, if you direct a, a localized magnetic field in a very narrow range of the metal disk, this localized magnetic field could be maybe from a hanging bar magnet just above. You could literally hold a bar magnet a few inches above this metal disk. Um, that would be one way you could obtain a B field in a localized region of the disk. And that alone doesn't cause a current. However, if you rotate the disk, then what's happening is the, uh, well, let, let's use the positive charges. Then the, um, oh, what is a, what is, physicists thought to be wrong, or thought to be right is now wrong. If we look at the positive charges, even though the, I know that's the electrons that move, but for the sake of, of consistency with the textbook, if we look at the positive charges in the metal here, then what we're doing is we can look at F equals QVB, or technically V cross B. So if you take a, a, a positive charge and you are rotating the disc, you are literally rotating or moving that positive charge to the right. And the B field is into the page. So if you use your right hand rule, B field into the page, um, um, uh, velocity or, or um, uh, current to the right, then your thumb, or not your thumb, the palm of your hand points up. So this will actually feel a force upwards which means it will move upwards. Now, of course, protons don't move. We know that now, but anyway. Um, so you see here, the current, the induced current, or what we call the eddy current, uh, on the right-hand side of this magnetic field uh, as it rotates, you can see the arrows here are pointing in a clockwise fashion because here they're feeling a force upwards, which causes clockwise. Now, the reason why they don't need a predefined circuit is because we know that um, uh, they mostly will travel in, in some sort of circular orbit because we know the, the, the trajectory of a moving particle in a magnetic field. We know that that's going to be circular. Now, this isn't a uniform B field, so it's not perfectly circular. It's going to be some sort of oblong, maybe ellipse, maybe something else, but it will still form a loop, a, a closed circuit loop. And you will get little circles, um, you get little swirls of, of current. And on the other side, um, let's say you had a proton, you had a proton that is uh, coming in on the other side, and uh, it's not experiencing any B field, and then now it is experiencing a B field, and it's going to feel the reverse. So it's going to feel something down. Uh, no, it's not. Sorry, no, it's not. It's uh, it's still here. It's not feeling any force uh, as it moves in. As it moves in, it's the same physics. It's the same um, Q equals V cross B. So as it moves into the region, it's going to feel a current, uh, a force upwards, just like the other one. Um, but however, when it feels a force upwards, uh, it's going to complete its loop backwards, where this is going to complete its loop forwards. So this is going to be counterclockwise. This is going to be clockwise. So you're going to get two separate eddy currents. and um, each of these eddy currents, again, if you use your, your right-hand rule, F equals I induced LB, picture a current, let me erase this for a second, picture a short length of wire here uh, with current traveling up. Right-hand rule, current traveling up, fingernails into the board, the palm of your hand is facing to the left. So that's going to be a resistive force. And it will be, it, it, it's actually felt, it's a resistive force that you can feel. That's really cool. Now, I actually, there's a, there's a very brief video um, with this. And you can see the video, um, very brief. It happens very, very briefly. You can see it in the theme song or the beginning little intro bit to every single one of our lab videos. And uh, I'm going to take a brief, because I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking here, we're doing a lot of review. So I'm going to take a brief pause, and I want to show you, now let's see if I can manage this. Um, 
Let's see if I can manage this. I might need my keyboard uh, for this. We'll see here. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Can I find, let's go here. Can I find the UTM physics page? And the on-screen keyboard does not want to work. Okay, let me grab the keyboard. Okay, I'm hoping that didn't disrupt the screen sharing by putting on my keyboard. So let me find UTM physics. Here it is. So if we find the theme song, um, oh, I, I, well, I guess it's the theme song. I guess that's, um, that's not necessarily at the beginning of every lab video. Um, how do you search of search? theme song. Aha, here it is. So if you look at the theme song for our physics page, come on. What's going on? Did it freeze on me? Oh, yep, yeah, the computer froze. Okay, the computer froze. I'm asking it to do too many things at once. Oh, now I can't do anything. All right, hopefully it's still recording. Okay. All right, well, I can minimize. All right, maybe I'll show you later because <laughs> it, uh, it will not work. Oh, and I can't, oh, what's going on now? There we go. Okay, now it's working, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, that was it right there. In fact, that's my arm uh, in that shot. So you see that we've got an aluminum disc that's spinning beneath, uh, beneath the magnet, and we are hanging a bar, well, it's not even a bar magnet, it's like a really, really small bar magnet. We're hanging a magnet off of a, off of a string that's only a few centimeters above, and as the disc below it spins, you see that there is uh, demonstrably a force acting both on the disc and on the magnet. Because Newton's third law, you can't just have a one-sided force. If there's a, a resistive force in the disc, that force has to be coming from something, and it's coming from uh, the magnet. So that magnet also feels a force, but because there's nothing, there's no, like I'm not holding the magnet in place, it's, it's, free, to pet, it's free to swing on, on the string like a pendulum, you see the magnet itself is displaced. So let me just rewind a little bit here, and uh, you can watch it uh, one more time. Well, I, I put the cat in a box. So I... So there you go. That's the closest I can I can get to showing you um, a demonstration, so to speak. Of, of what an eddy current is. Again, if I was in person, I would absolutely do this for you in person, but um, this is as close as we can possibly get. Uh, okay, so for the interest of time, uh, I don't think uh, I wanna pull you here, but I will, I will definitely talk about this. So an eddy current example, let's say we had a magnet, like a bar magnet, and you just drop it in air, you just drop it off the table or, or what have you then it will obviously fall with an acceleration of g, obviously. It's just, that's a, it's just an object at that point. However, if you take the exact same magnet and you had a conducting loop and you dropped it through the conducting loop, then we know from Faraday's law that because the magnet is getting closer and closer to, to the loop, you are changing the flux Changing a flux will means you'll induce a voltage, and because it's a, co a conducting loop, the voltage will then induce a current. And we know because of Lenz's law, the induced current will oppose the change. You're gonna get an eddy current, and that will resist the motion. So it'll be, a, it'll be an upwards force. So as the magnet falls through here, um, this copper wire will feel uh, uh, let me change my color here. We'll feel a current, uh, what looks to be in and around counterclockwise. 
And this B field uh, that it induces will be a B field upwards to combat the increased B field downwards. And the induced B field upwards, the north pole here, will repel the north pole of the magnet, thus slowing it down. So the acceleration of this magnet will be less than that of G. It won't be zero. Maybe it is zero, depending if it's, if, it's a if it's a long enough thing, but it'll be less than G. So it will fall slower. Now, interestingly enough, if you take this copper loop and you turn this copper loop into a copper pipe, so you turn the copper loop into a copper pipe, um, or, or equivalently like a, a solenoid or a coil. So many, many, many loops. You can think of this as sort of many, many, many loops, copper loops um, stacked on top of each other. And you repeat this, you drop uh, a bar magnet through. Then as it drops, it doesn't just have one region in space that, that is uh, creating an upwards force. As it's dropping, every point along its descent uh, is able to induce a backwards or induce a current that opposes this motion. So if you actually have a long enough pipe, uh, if you drop a magnet through, um, the magnet will eventually hit terminal velocity because the resistive force, as you know, is a function of speed, right? You know Q or F equals QVB. The faster you travel, the more the force. So gravity will pull it down. Um, and it will accelerate. As it accelerates, the speed becomes faster. And as the speed becomes faster, the, the eddy current, the backwards force will get stronger and uh, eventually it'll equal out. So eventually it'll find a speed at which the upwards force balances gravity. And this is the speed, uh, I'll say when, when the resistive, resistive force balances gravity, then you reach terminal velocity. Okay, so that's, that's why a, 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 a falling magnet uh, will, will reach terminal velocity in, in a conductor or a, a, some sort of conducting loop. Uh, vice versa is also true. If you, if you are somehow able to drop um, a piece of metal through a circular magnet, the same thing would happen. It doesn't matter which one's magnetized. It's relative motion, whether the magnet's moving relative to the wire or the wire's moving relative to the magnet. Um, it's all relative, it doesn't really matter, as long as there's movement. Okay, so there's actually, um, well, what I think to be a very cool example uh, I have a feeling this, this example was not done in Canada because in Canada, you have to book an MRI machine like six months in advance. And I, I can't, and they're, they're hugely expensive to operate and to maintain and to purchase. So I, I can't imagine that anyone that has access to an MRI machine would ever be allowed to waste time on something like this. So something tells me uh, this video comes from America the, the land of capitalist society where money buys you everything. Um, it's a cool video nonetheless. I just, I don't think it's Canadian. What this video I'm about to show you is, it is a, let me grab a different color here. It is an aluminum slab. Now, why is it important that this is an aluminum slab and not steel? Well, in an MRI machine, as many of you who are in pre-med know, it's a very, very powerful magnet. Well, it's actually an electromagnet, but nonetheless, um, very powerful, like using physics, I'll tell you it's about somewhere between seven and 12 Tesla, depending on how big the MRI machine is and, and stuff like that. That's incredibly strong. And before they put you in there, they make sure that you have no earrings on, no jewelry. Um, if you have fillings in your, certain types of fillings, um, um, will, will get ripped right out of your, your, your skull. So, and for people who have the sort of the older style fillings, um, they're not even able to have MRIs at all. Uh, maybe on their leg and they keep their face sort of away. Even then it's kind of iffy. So um, you can't use a steel block in this demo because a steel block would just get 
you know, it would just destroy the MRI machine. Aluminum, however, aluminum is not magnetic. If you take a fridge magnet and you try to stick it to some aluminum, it won't work. Um, I actually just found out my fridge, which I thought was a, a stainless steel fridge, is not. Um, it must be made out of aluminum because magnets don't stick to it. So that was, they stick to the side of the fridge though, but not, not the front of the fridge. Anyway, so here it's still metal. Aluminum is still a conductor. And um, what this demonstration is going to show you is he's going to take a block of aluminum and he's going to nudge it. So it's going to fall. And if, if this was done with, the, with, with no magnetic field, then it's no different than dropping, dropping an object. Just it falls at G. However, if it falls in a magnetic field, then there's going to be a resistive force to resist the change, the change being falling. So it's going to resist the change and try to prop it back upright. And you'll see here that it actually falls in slow motion and it falls at a constant speed because it's hitting terminal velocity. So let's have a look see. So there's no sound to the video, but I'll try to narrow. You've seen it now a few times. So here, um, he's dropping it in a different direction. So when he drops it sideways, there's no change in flux. But when it falls, actually, I'm going to pause this temporarily. So what's happening here is when it falls, when it falls down, the magnetic field lines look, it's, it's an electromagnet, so they, they look like a bar magnet. They're coming through this way. Okay, so when, when the um, block falls down like this, then what you're doing is you're not changing the area of, of, the, of the whatever. Um, you're not changing the strength of the B field. What you're manipulating here is you're manipulating the angle. And as it falls, you know, when, when, when the block looks like this, then you only have one or two field lines going through it. But when the, when the block is sort of upright, like we see here, then we have all of the field lines going through it. So that angle, that change in angle, um, changes how many field lines are going through it. And then that's what you get Faraday's law from. Faraday's law kicks in, and then you get an induced current in such a, in such a way that it opposes the motion. However, um, you just saw here in the video that he had it on its side. He had the short side and he let it fall sideways. Okay, instead of forwards, he's, he let it fall sideways. Now, the reason why that fell really quickly in the video is because if you, again, if you look at the field lines, the field lines are coming through and as it falls sideways, or maybe I'll draw that in a dotted line, as it falls sideways, Okay, you still have the same number of field lines going through the surface. So even though it's moving through, um, it's the same number of field lines are passing through that, that cross-sectional area. So there, is, there isn't that induced eddy current, and there isn't that, that resistive force, and it falls pretty quickly. So I'm going to resume it again, and we can keep looking. So here he's holding it off-center. Now, it, without a magnetic field, that would just fall. Here again, it's on a bit of an angle falling forwards. Um, so you've got those magnetic field lines coming straight out parallel. And as the angle is changing, you're changing the number of field lines. So you're inducing a backwards current. But you can see here it's falling at mostly a constant, mostly a constant velocity because that's terminal velocity because it's such a strong magnetic field. Um, you don't really need a very fast moving, a very fast moving object uh, to induce such a strong current. There he's going to do it on its side again, and the side it falls pretty quickly, right? Because as it's falling sideways, you're not changing um, the flux. Okay, 
Now, this video goes on for many minutes just repeating the same thing. Um, so we don't have to watch the whole thing, but I, I think it's cool. Um, I think it'd be very cool to have access to an MRI machine. And uh, I mean, obviously for the medical benefits, but even for the physics, I think, you know, a physicist would, would, would probably break an MRI machine pretty fast because we would, we would just be using it for fun little things like that. Um, okay, so let's move on. We've done enough concepts for at least momentarily. Let's talk about applications of this because I would say Faraday's law is probably the one thing in first year physics, both 136 and 137, maybe aside from classical mechanics like cars and the physics of a car and driving and stuff like that. But um, Faraday's law is probably one of the most commonly used things in the real world and you have absolutely no idea that it's Faraday's law governing what, what that, cool, that cool new gadget is. So one example is, is induction cooktops. Uh, these came out maybe about 10 years ago and, uh, or at least became mass consumable about 10 years ago, um, where they advertised, oh look, you could be cooking, you know, boiling a pot of water and you could move the pot of water away and, and touch, touch the stove top with your hand immediately and you wouldn't get burned. Ooh, it's safe. Um, you know, that is called an induction cooktop and that is that, that it uses Faraday's law to, to work. So what, how do they work? Well, the basic premise is underneath, um, underneath that region, instead of a heating element, which is usually what you would get on a stove is, is um, a piece of metal that has a very high resistance. You're pumping a huge amount of current through. It glows red and it heats up. It heats up because of the resistance, just like a light bulb. And uh, that's how the, the heat gets to the pot and cooks your food. An induction cooktop, however, works not through um, conduction, not through like literally having a, a metal pan touching a hot other piece of metal. This works through eddy currents. So what, what happens here is you have a coil underneath there and you have an electricity that runs through the coil. Now, when there's a, a current traveling through the coil, we know that it, it will induce a B field. And uh, the B field will look a lot like what, what is drawn here. It'll look like a bar magnet. Now, if you put a metal pan or pot um, directly on top of this coil, then the bottom of that metal pan will be exposed to, oh, let me try that in a different color, will be exposed to, the top end of that B field. Now, we have to have a changing flux. If you just place the pan on there and leave it, then although the bottom of the pan is experiencing a non-zero flux, it's not changing, it's a constant flux. So you can't just have a battery hooked up to this. It has to be an alternating current. And what we have in our homes is an alternating current, AC current. Now, we haven't talked about AC current in this class, nor will we really, we'll talk about it a little bit in the, in, in the coming lecture slides and maybe tomorrow, um, but we won't talk about the hardcore math. All an alternating current is, it's a DC current that just slips back and forth. So the current is traveling clockwise, and then the current is traveling counterclockwise and then it's traveling clockwise, and then it's traveling counterclockwise. And it flips back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's why it's called alternating. It's, it's direct current that keeps flipping direction back and forth, left and right. Now in Canada or, or North America, um, it flips back and forth 60 times per second. So we call that 60 hertz. Um, in, in Europe, it travels back and forth a different number of times per second. And off the top of my head, I, I can't remember what it is, but it's, it's not 60. So that's why when you go to Europe, you need that adapter because the adapter helps convert uh, their electrical grid with the 240 volts instead of 120 and, and their frequency of alternating current compared to ours. And you need that circuitry to sort of force the current to behave in such a way that our electrical devices can use the power without damaging them. Anyway, that aside, here we have, um, if we have an alternating current, then the magnetic field switches between going this direction to um, this direction, 60 times a second. And that is a changing flux, 60 times a second. That's changing pretty quickly. So you have all of the magnetic field going down in, in one moment in time. And then uh, a very, very, very brief moment later, 
we have the magnetic field lines traveling up. And it, it keeps switching like that 60 times a second. So Faraday's law kicks in and says this is a changing flux. And it will induce eddy currents, as you see here. It will induce little tiny circular eddy currents in the bottom of your pot. And um, there is resistance in metal. And when there's a current, V equals IR, V from uh, Faraday's law or, or electromotive force from Faraday's law, R, the resistance of, of the metal in the pot itself. So, and then current. So uh, you're gonna get a current, you're gonna get resistance. And we've already analyzed, um, you know, energy equals power times time. So the longer you have the pot on, the more joules um, as, as, as the, the length of time of the, the, the pot is allowed to cook, the more joules of energy you are able to impose into the food. And that is how um, you can get heat from the bottom of the pan without having the cooktop itself hot because it's not through conduction, it's through induction, which is really, really cool. Now, that also begs the question, can you do this with any pot? And um, for those of you who have induction cooks, uh, cooktops at home, you'll, you'll realize, or you may be asking me, but Mark, you can't just do that with any old, uh, with, with any old metal pot. Not all pots are metal. Look at the mechanism by which um, the heat is generated. It's through the resistance in the bottom, right? So if you have a, you know, a, a, a thin pot, then you're not necessarily going to have enough material to generate enough heat to, you know, it, for this eddy current to produce enough heat into the food. So if you notice, if you have special induction uh, cookware, you'll notice that there's an extra thick piece of, of metal that is sort of welded to the bottom of the pot. You'll notice this if you, even if you Google, if you, um, after the lecture, if you want, you can Google on, I don't even know where you would buy online cooking, Walmart, I don't know, um, Google induction pots. And if you, or Amazon, I guess would be a, a safer bet. You could definitely see one on Amazon. Um, you can zoom into the picture and you'll see the bottom of the pot is extra thick compared to a normal, a normal pan. And they need that extra metal there because they're, they're trying to take advantage of the resistance to, to generate uh, enough heat to transfer into the food. Um, another application of Faraday's law that's been around for eons, um, well before induction cooktops, is metal detectors. You know, you might be more familiar with metal detectors at, say, the airport. Um, or, you know, you know those, new, those new ones where you have to, you know, stand with the hands above your head or whatever. Those aren't quite metal detectors. They use something similar, but slightly different. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe you, you've used these at the beach. You know, you can buy a metal detector on a pole and, uh, and uh, find some buried treasure in the sand. Um, this is also working on the principle of Faraday's law. What happens in metal detectors is there is a source current, you know, it's like with a, with a battery. And um, this, what this does is this generates, uh, the, the source current generates, uh, here's the source current here. Um, so using your right hand rule, we see that the magnetic field will look like down, down, down. So the magnetic field, as you see here in the picture, um, at the center of the loop is all facing down. And what you're doing is you have to sweep it. You've got to move and sweep the end of your metal detector. If you just hold the metal detector stationary over a piece of metal, it won't notice it. So what's happening here is you're sweeping this metal detector across a piece of metal. So what happens is um, the, the magnetic field lines from the metal detector are being sweeped across it. So you know here you have a, a full flux, and then maybe a, a moment later in time, your, your, your head of your, the head of your metal detector is maybe say over here and all your field lines are over here and then the flux is zero. Well, if the flux changes between a maximum to zero, it's going to induce an eddy current in this thing. And that, that eddy current is, is still a current, it's a physical current, there are electrons that are actually moving. And that eddy current within itself will induce its own B field. So this is B prime, B prime being B induced. And this, this induced B field uh, is being felt by this thing. And that, that's a changing flux through this loop. 
So then we have a second instance of Faraday's law because this loop feels a changing flux. And then we have its own induced current. And that own induced current can be felt and sensed by the circuitry in the metal detector itself and say, oh, I'm detecting a back EMF. I'm detecting a, an eddy current in my, in my own loop. And then that's when it sounds the alarm beep, 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 there's a piece of metal here. So really what a metal detector is doing is it's reacting to the magnetic field produced by the eddy current when you're sweeping the head across a piece of metal. And something very similar happens in an airport. Um, if you stand stationary in a metal detector, uh, you won't notice anything. So that's why they, they pause you at an airport. They say, wait there. And then when you're ready, they wave you through and you have to walk through. You can't just pause in the metal detector. They, they wave you on through. If you have to motion, you, you need that velocity to have, and, and that velocity will have that changing, that changing flux through your body. And if you have a piece of metal on you, it will induce an eddy current. And then that eddy current will then feel everything else. So that's, that's, that's really cool, uh, I think. And you can actually sort of, um, the more physics you know, you can actually sort of get around metal detectors if you, if you really know the physics. Because um, you know, once you know the, the ins and outs of magnetism and, and what can cause induced currents and how the metal detectors work, you can, you know, you can try to shield it and stuff like that. And, and it's, it's, just, it's really cool. You know, instead of walk, the, the faster you walk through a metal detector, the easier the metal detector can detect metal, right? So the other, the other thing you can do is you can try walking through a little bit slower. You know, all, all these other sorts of fun things. Um, okay, so here's an example. Um, I don't know if we have time to do this at the moment, so we might come back tomorrow uh, at the beginning of lecture to do this. Um, there's a bunch of problems here that I've included. Um, I don't necessarily intend to do all of them in lecture. Uh, some of them here, I even put the solution. So I might, tomorrow, I might do some of the ones that don't have a solution, like, like this one here. Um, but uh, we definitely don't have time in lecture to do all of them. But maybe tomorrow is a bit of a refresher for what we talked about today. Um, however, there's one last thing I want to start talking about today. We'll finish talking about it tomorrow, is generators. So I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, if you recall, you recall um, we had an example where we had a square loop of wire that was inside a uniform B field. And we were pulling this wire, this loop of wire out. And we noticed that our mechanical energy of pulling the wire was able to induce a current. Now we've been talking all, all lecture about this, but that was sort of the first exposure we kind of had to that sort of um, nifty idea. And I told you that that was sort of the basis of a generator. So let's actually come back to that now and we'll formally talk about generators. So what is a generator? Well, in terms of physics, all a generator is, is uh, a, a mechanism by which we can take advantage of converting mechanical energy, which we have readily available, um, into electrical energy, which would be a current. So you, a generator could be um, like, like turning a crank, you know, the old cars from like the early 1900s to start the car. Um, you know, you had to go out to the front, and there was a crank on the front of the car, and you had to turn the crank to start the car. That would be a form of a generator, right? You're, you're converting mechanical energy into electrical potential energy. And a gasoline, this, the, the picture here on the slide is an example of, of a modern looking um, gasoline generator where you pour gas in. Gas takes the place of your arm and it, it physically moves this, this loop of wire through a magnetic field. And using Faraday's law, this generator can produce and generate electricity. Now, that's pretty much all there is to it in all honesty, but here are some schematics. So buried within the generator, um, yes, there's gasoline, there's a gasoline engine because you, know, you wanna automate the, the mechanical energy. You don't wanna be sitting here yourself doing this. But anyway, um, that aside, what's actually happening is you have a loop of wire, okay, in the generator and the loop of wire is, is connected to a shaft. It's 
connected to a shaft. You can't see the grain on the black. It's connected to, oh, that's much better, connected to the shaft. And um, the shaft is rotated either by your arm or I guess in the case of a gasoline generator, rotated by the gasoline engine. Now, what's happening here is there is a permanent magnet inside, sorry, uh, inside the generator. And what's happening here is the loop is within the permanent magnet. And when you have the shaft connected to the gasoline engine, the shaft physically rotates the loop. And there is, I don't know how to draw this very well. Um, there is some sort of permanent magnet around here. We'll say permanent magnet. And that's where, that's where this magnetic field is coming from. It's coming from the permanent magnet. Um, if, you, if you want to, you can think of it like a U-shaped magnet if you, if you want to. And the coil inside is physically and forcefully being rotated within the magnetic field. So um, in which direction, we know Faraday's law is gonna kick in, in which direction is the induced current going to be? Well, we think to ourselves, okay, we know flux is B A cos theta. Which factor is a, is a gasoline generator uh, taking advantage of to generate electricity? Well, it's using a permanent magnet, so it's not taking advantage of changing the magnetic field strength, because it's a, it's a permanent magnet. It is what it is. Are we changing the area of the loop? Nope. The area of the loop is, is buried inside. Um, we have no ability to change it. So that's not what we're taking advantage of. We are taking advantage, however, of the angle between the B field and the area vector, the, the normal to the, to the face of the loop. So at the moment in this picture, um, as, a, as an example, the B field is uh, traveling or directed horizontally. So at this moment in time, there is no flux through the loop. That all the field lines are passing over the loop, not through the loop. Now, if you crank it, forcefully crank it in this direction, as indicated here, then um, at a moment in time later, the loop is going to be uh, up at a bit of an angle. So phi two is gonna be greater than zero. We are increasing the number of field lines, increasing the number of field lines through the loop. Now, Faraday's law, or I should say Lenz's law, says the induced current would want to oppose that. We are increasing the number of field lines through the loop. We want to decrease the number of field lines through the loop. So that means the induced B field would be, now if, if, we, if we drew the loop like upright like this, um, we would want to have an induced B field backwards, B induced backwards, and use your right hand rule, thumb backwards, uh, and, and curl your fingers, and you see the current would look like this. So the current would look like this in the loop, given that this is the direction in which we are rotating it. Okay, so that's how a generator works. Now, um, for those of you who don't have cottages or don't know that hospitals have generators, um, you know, m many of you will think that you don't have, a, you've never seen a generator in action before, but you have. It's called an alternator. You know your car has batteries. And why does a car have a battery? Well, back in the early 1900s, um, well, you need a spark to burn, to burn the gasoline, right? That spark used to come from the spark plug. And where did that spark come from? Well, in the good old days of 1920s, um, when you wanted to start your car, you would crank it with your own arm and you would, you would crank this, this loop uh, in, in a magnet and that would generate a current while your arm was forcefully turning this coil in a magnet. And it was hard to do. It was very hard to do because there's, a, there's that back EMF that you're feeling. And so it was really hard to start, a, to start the car, especially in the wintertime in Canada. Anyway, that, that's a different story. Um, so you need, this, you need this, this, this um, source of energy for the spark plugs. Now, once the, the car was started, um, there was an alternator. 
Okay, so once the car was started, um, the engine was burning gasoline and to get it to mechan the source of, of mechanical energy. And in addition to pulling the car forward, the, the, um, the car would, uh, the engine would also spin something called an alternator. So you see here, there's actually a mess of coils here, just a huge rat's nest of coils. Um, all this is, is just a very, very well thought out uh, way to wrap very efficiently as many loops of wire as they can in a limited amount of space. So they didn't just do it messily and haphazardly. They, they did it in a very logical way. And what they're doing here is um, there is a, a, a permanent magnet, as you can see here. And the gasoline engine, once, once it got started, it, uh, it, it was spinning this, mag uh, this, this, this um, uh, loop of wire, mess of, of loops of wire in this magnetic field. And it was then providing the energy for the spark plugs. To continue, to continue delivering the spark, it needs to ignite the gas to continue to run the alternator. It's, it's just a, a well-oiled machine, quite literally a well-oiled machine. It's, it's, it's a perfect balance of, of physics. And you might be thinking, well, you know, it sounds like, you know, a free energy machine. Like, as long as the engine's rolling, the, the alternator can spin and, and can, you know, power the spark plugs, which can continue the engine rolling. Yes, that's what's happening. But again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, there's friction in the system, there's combustion, so you're losing some energy due to heat. You know, there's resistance in the wires. So, you know, you can't just get the engine moving and then it's forever moving. You're constantly having to feed it mechanical power by burning gasoline. So, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. How is it getting this power? By burning, continually burning gasoline. And that's, that's why you have to fill up on gas every now and then. Now, since the 1920s, we've developed batteries, car batteries. Well, all batteries, but specifically car batteries in this case. So instead of having to crank your car now in modern time, uh, we use batteries. So the, the battery is, you know, in the engine compartment of your car, and it, it, it takes the place of, of you actually cranking the engine. So your, your car has something called a starter, and a starter is, is literally a DC motor. So your car has a starter. And if you don't believe me, you can Google, you can Google like starter for a car or a lawnmower or whatever. And all this is, is it's a DC motor and it, it mimics your arm cranking the engine. It, it, it literally with a set of gears uh, is connected. There's a flywheel that comes out when you, when you turn the key in your car, there's a flywheel from the starter that comes out that connects to the engine. And then um, the battery in your car I think it's a 12 volt battery, so it's not even a super high voltage. Um, the battery in your car will, will run the DC motor in the starter and it artificially cranks the engine. And then uh, your battery will also simultaneously provide the power for the spark plugs. And then once your car is running, it, it moves the alternator and the alternator will provide the power for your car stereo, your headlights, your horn, the spark plugs and, and everything else and your air conditioning. Now, here's the question though. Why do you only have to like, like you have to charge your phone almost on a daily basis. You know, using your phone, your battery dies. Why do you only have to change the, the car battery once every like three or four years? Well, because as the car is running, the alternator will charge the battery. So it's this really nice marriage of, of you know, converting chemical potential energy like gasoline into electrical potential energy. And that marriage is done through Faraday's law. It's really, really quite beautiful. And that's why if you use like, a, if you go to a drive-in theater, um, not you know, like, you know, you're sitting in your car, your engine's off and you're, you've got your stereo on, um, they, at intermission, there's always a sign or a little ad that comes up that says, you know, during intermission, everyone turn on your car and let it run for 10 minutes. And, you know, I've literally heard people say, well, that's just a waste of gas. That's just stupid. Why are they saying that? Well, they're saying that because if your car isn't running, your, your car stereo is running on your car battery and nothing's charging your car battery. And, and what they would hate for you to do is at the end of the movie, your, your battery is so dead, it doesn't have enough juice to turn your car engine. So um, they tell you at, at intermission to turn on your car so you can spend 15, 20 minutes um, charging the battery in your car. Now, 
As a quick side note about cars, um, I drive a standard. I don't drive an automatic. I drive a standard. And I only drive, well, I drive standard for two reasons. I like to have total control over my two ton piece of self perpetuating death metal. Um, you know, a car is effectively a weapon on the road. And I, I personally want to be in total control of that weapon at 100% of the time. So I don't like an automatic transmission telling me what I can and cannot do with my car. Um, that's one reason why I drive a standard. The other reason why I drive a standard is because um, you can actually pop the clutch to, to turn the motor of the car. And this happened to me once. I was actually at the drive-in once about three years ago. And uh, I didn't realize this. My battery was getting old and it was needing to be changed soon. I just didn't realize. And uh, my car didn't start after, after the movie. And luckily for me, I was able to use the kinetic energy of my car. You're, you're always parked on a little bit of a hill when you're watching, um, when you're watching um, a drive-in theater. Um, so the car itself was on a bit of an incline, about a three or four degree incline. So what I did was I let the car, took the brakes off, and I let the car roll backwards, and I popped the clutch. You know, the car had momentum, the car had velocity, it had kinetic energy. And when I engaged the clutch, I connected the engine with the tires, and I stole the kinetic energy of the car, and I used the kinetic energy of the car in, in, in place of the starter, or in place of the battery, and it, it was able to turn the engine over once and that's all it needed to have one spark of the spark plug to ignite the gas and you can start the car that way and then as i drove home it, it charged the battery and then a few few days later i replaced the battery because i realized it was getting old so two reasons why physicists should always drive a clutch um a lot more fun oh they're also a lot more fun too oh yeah rowena also drives a stick i should have uh, I, I i knew that and i should have mentioned that so uh, I don't know, well, her, her, dad's, her dad's not a physicist and her dad also drives a stick. So maybe there are other reasons why she drives uh, a standard. But anyway, um, the other, I was gonna say something else. Oh, um, uh, there, there is one type of automatic transmission that I will lovingly drive, not just begrudgingly drive. Um, if you have an electric car, let's say like a Tesla, um, a Tesla doesn't have any transmission, quite frankly, um, a Tesla, it, it has its motors, instead of a gasoline motor, it has an electric motor. And each tire looks, the, the engine on each tire looks a lot like an alternator, actually. Each tire has its own DC motor. It, it, each tire has its own mess of coils. And it, it, uh, we pump current through it from the battery. And when you pump current through a coil, we get torque on the coil. We've already talked about that previously, torque on a coil. Uh, remember, torque on a coil was IAB. So you get torque on this coil and it actually, that's what rotates the tires forward. So there is no clutch. There is no, in, there's, no there's nothing in between me and the tire. It's still with an electric car, it's you and then the tire. You know, uh, with, a, with an automatic transmission, you know, there are times when you wanna go accelerate and then your engine doesn't respond because there's a bunch of moving parts underneath your car that's automated and, and you know, you want it to do something that doesn't right away and it's really frustrating. So anyway, with an electric car, it's, there's still nothing, be, like, there is nothing automated. There's no gears. If you want to go faster, you just deliver more current to, to, the, to, the, to the motor, and then more current means more torque, which means faster movement. It's pretty simple. And uh, you might ask yourself, well, how do you charge the car on, on a, or how, well, how do you charge the battery on an electric car? Yes, you have to charge it more frequently. People with a Tesla right now, I think you can get up to maybe like 200 kilometers before you have to recharge the battery. Um, but the way they sort of elongate that span is with the brakes, instead of brake pads where you squeeze, you squeeze the tires, they use, um, in, well, they, they do partially that as well in case you need to stop really quickly, but they use magnetic braking. Um, when you brake, they, they turn the DC motor into a generator. When they break, instead of feeding current to the DC motor, they, they stop the current from the battery when you push on the brake. And what they do is they, they use the rotation of the tire as, as a generator to spin the coil inside the magnet. And that creates a back EMF, which charges the battery. So in a, in a Tesla, every time you brake, you are partially charging the battery. So again, this marriage of of old technology and new technology, but it's based on the same physics. Whether you have a, a com an internal combustion engine, it, it's, there's still a lot of Faraday's law in it. 
And if you have a Tesla, it's just a newer, shiny version of a car. Um, and, and instead of burning gasoline, you're using up stored chemical charge in a battery, but you still have the sort of marriage of DC motors and Faraday's law. So I just, there is so much physics that goes into a car. It's just, it's mind blowing how cool it is. Like, you know, there's the physics of driving and the friction pulling the car forward and centripetal motion when you turn a corner and torque when you want to flip a car and banked curves when you go on the highway, like all the classical physics. And then there's those little modern physics in a car that's just remarkably cool. Absolutely remarkably cool. Um, okay, so I don't want to jump into transformers just yet um, because that's a whole new, that's a whole new topic. Um, and there's, it's, there's quite a lot to that topic in, in, in five minutes that it, it would not be, it would not be appropriate to sort of start a topic and then stop. So a natural stopping point would be the end of generators. Um, the only thing I really expect students to really uh, understand from a generator is, well, I mean, for one, the underlying physics is Faraday's law. So, um, you know, what can you do with generators? What kind of homework questions can you do with generators? You know, all a generator is, is just a loop of wire that is being rotated through a magnetic field. So the equation you're still dealing with is Faraday's law, BA cos theta, or I should say the derivative of BA cos theta. So, you know, you can talk about, um, you know, the faster, the faster, uh, the, the faster rotation rate, the more voltage is going to be generated. Um, the more loops you have, the more voltage is going to be generated. Um, so generators, like, there, there's nothing new with a generator. Um, there's no new physics. There's no, e there's no new equation with a generator. The only thing new is the application, right? It's all the same physics. Um, the chapter of generators is, is merely uh, an example of how we can use Faraday's law to our human advantage and how, if you know physics, you can actually manipulate nature around you to, to do your bidding, which is actually a really... If, if that doesn't convince you to be a physicist, I really don't know what else could. Um, you know, when you actually know physics, you can manipulate everything around you to, to, to make your life easier. That's really the, the fun part about being a physicist. Uh, okay, so that's enough for today. Um, we're a few minutes early, which is okay. So I'm going to stop the recording, but then I'm going to hang on the line and I'm going to take any questions that, um, that students may have. Okay, so if you're watching on YouTube, I will see you tomorrow and we will pick it up with an example of, of Faraday's law that we skipped earlier and then we're going to resume it with transformers. Okay, ciao for now.